All right, welcome back. Um, and if you're just joining, welcome. Um, again, where this is the public, Grazing Public Lands 101, how a uh, multi-state discussion on how to start and build a public lands grazing program. Um, so again, thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Mary C, for that great presentation earlier. And we're gonna have our next presentation, Chris Trozen. Chris is the deputy manager for the US Fish and Wildlife Services at the St. Croix Wetland Management District and is charged with managing about 9,000 acres of public land in Dune, Polk and St. Croix counties. His aspiration for a career with the service began in the summer of 97 while working as a volunteer at the Upper, Upper Sears National Wildlife Refuge located in North Central North Dakota. While North Dakota, Mr. Trozen earned degrees in zoology and animal and range science from North Dakota State University and spent time working at both the Upper Sears and J. Clark Slurry National Wildlife Refuge. He moved to Minnesota in 2003 to continue his career with the service as a wildlife refuge specialist at Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge and Wetland Management District. In 2010, Mr. Trozen moved to Wisconsin to become a wildlife biologist where he served the public in the role for 11 years. In 2021, he was able to slide back into the public land management role where he is better able to pursue his passion, working with people to do good things for wildlife and their habitat. So thank you, Chris, for being willing to share your expertise with us. He's going to talk a bit about relationship building and the importance of building those relationships um, with grazing on public land. Um, so thanks again, Chris, and I'll hand it off to you. Okay, so I'll get started. Thank you so much for the introduction, and thanks for the opportunity to, to visit with you guys today. Um, so this afternoon, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, who we are at the St. Croix Wetland Management District. Just give you a little bit about our mission. I guess what kind of public servant would it, would I be if I didn't provide you with our mission out of our office here? Um, I'm going to go over a little bit about the evolution of grazing at the St. Croix Wetland Management District. Get into some some of the challenges that we've had um, with public lands grazing, and then focus on one of our our early projects in two, 2014, which really kind of catapulted our, our grazing program to where it's at now. Um, hit on some lessons learned and then you give you an update on kind of our current capacity to graze out of our office here um, in, in western Wisconsin. So just to begin with, our mission is to uh, restore historic prairie and wetland complexes and oak savannas to benefit uh, waterfowl and grassland dependent birds. So gra grazing aligns perfectly with that. And um, something that I've always wanted to be a part of. And I was glad when I came to St. Croix in 2010 um, that there was the start of a grazing program. And uh, I was able to kind of work with partners to build it into something uh, a bit more than what it was uh, 12 years ago. Um, before I begin, I just want to hit on a few things. Um, there's lots of science that supports grazing. Um, and there's a lot of confirmation bias with grazing. So if people come in with an opinion, there's certainly a lot of data out there that can support their, their opinion, whether they're um, for or against grazing. And something that I've encountered here in Western Wisconsin as I've tried to develop this grazing program um, out of our office. Um, I feel strongly that grazing when done correctly certainly does benefit wildlife and their habitat. And then I, I, you know, one of the reasons why we started to develop um, more grazing or provide more opportunities for grazing is that, you know, we manage 9,000 acres here in Western Wisconsin, about um, 5,500 acres of it is in grass or oak savanna. And we just, we just can't burn all of it every year as, as much as we'd like to burn every year. And so um, we were looking for more landscape level management tools and, um, started to work more with grazing. And then lastly, this last point, and you'll kind of see this throughout um, my presentation, and you've heard it from others already, that, you know, starting a grazing program on public lands isn't easy. Um, but I can confidently say that it, it, it is beneficial. Um, and there are good and bad days, and I'll get into some of that as well. Um, so where, where did we come from? So I, I came here in 2010. And um, before I got here, I'd like to say it was like pre me or pre Chris Trozen. Um, our office worked with neighbors um, to do some grazing. I think we did some horse grazing. There's some horses that grazed on a, on a property. 
Uh, and then we worked with adjacent landowners who had cattle and, and, and that's not bad. I think that's really good. You know, working with folks who live close to units, I think adds a lot of value. Um, but we didn't really do much outreach to other grazers. And so there may have been other people within our local landscape who would have loved to come out and do some grazing on public lands, but we just didn't do that outreach work. Um, historically, we did season long grazing. So we just put livestock out through for a period of time. Uh, we didn't partition up our pastures to have them graze in smaller paddocks. And so uh, for the most part, folks, the, the, the livestock that were out there would just um, graze wherever they would like to. Um, and then again, uh, most of our, our landscape level management was done with spring burning. And we were able to burn about, you know, 800 to 1000 acres a year. Um, but our fire budgets have kind of um, ebbed and flowed, I guess, if you will. And we've reallocated some of our fire staff to other areas. And so our capacity to burn out of our offices is decreased. I think last year we burned about uh, 700 acres and with 5,500 acres of grassland habitat to manage, um, we, need, we need more. So that's why we're spending more time with grazing. Um, some of the challenges with, as you all probably are aware of, the um, challenges with managing public lands is just the lack of infrastructure. Um, one of the rules of thumb when we acquired land here in Western Wisconsin is, and, and most of the other places I work with, we would just remove the old infrastructure, boundary fences, interior fences. Um, when there was an old home site on a property, we would fill the well. Um, and so when I got here, a lot of the lands were just blank slates. They were just grassland habitat or oak savanna habitat or woodland and wetland habitat. And so um, there wasn't much to work with. Um, when you're trying to run cattle, as Aaron alluded to earlier, there's, there's in, inconsistent water sources. And, you know, most of the water that are on these parcels are, are wetlands. Um, there's no electricity on these parcels. So trying to manage livestock using electric fences is challenging. And then um, I found that there was, a, there was very minimal public awareness for grazing out here. Um, we kind of amped up our fire program in 2003. And when we first started burning, uh, there would be smoke in the sky and, and our neighbors would come and visit and be very upset with, with burning. And over a period of um, 15 years or so, our neighbors got really comfortable with seeing smoke in the sky and, and understood a bit more about how we and why we used fire, how we used fire and, and why we used fire. And I believe that we've come a long ways in the last 10 years um, with grazing. You know, initially when we put livestock out there, we would get complaints from neighbors uh, who wanted to walk a WPA. And I, I can remember one example um, this, one of our neighbors called and said they were super upset. They couldn't walk out there. And, uh, I don't, many of you don't know me, but, uh, I'm the kind of person who just shows up and makes things happen. And I, I, I drove up to this gentleman's house and he was outside working and I asked him if he wanted, and obviously this was pre COVID and I asked him if he would, wanted to jump in my truck with me and go out and visit the livestock. And sure enough, he did. Um, and we went out and we walked, uh, amongst the cattle and, uh, you know, he was, you know, his imagination got the best of him. He thought the worst. And certainly it wasn't the cattle just did their own thing. And I told him just kind of stay away from them. They're not really used to being in this new area. And uh, from then on out, everything was, was, um, was really good with that adjacent landowner neighbor. And then another thing that I found um, that was interesting, I spent some time out West and there was, there's standard rental rates for public lands, um, for grazing on public lands. And there just wasn't that here in Wisconsin. Um, and I thought to myself, you know, I, I honestly thought, stayed up nights thinking about all of these challenges associated with grazing. And then I, I came to the conclusion that I, I really don't have to come, you know, answer all of these issues on my own. I can work with the grazer who ends up winning the bid to help me address these issues. And so that's what I did. I, I started to develop a, a team, if you will. Um, there's a gentleman named Brian Brzezinski who worked for the River Country RNRC&D, who was phenomenal. He just 
he knew people who grazed livestock in my local area. And I decided to put together a, a listening group and had neighbors and grazers come and just sit down with me one evening in 2012, 2012, um, 2013, this was in 2013 in April. And they came and they met at our office and I put a map up and I said, this is what we wanna do. What do you need from us to be comfortable enough to bring your livestock out here? And it was a great meeting. We ended it up, um, you know, had a lot of discussion. We ended up going out to one of the sites and visiting the site so that they could see it for themselves at a later date. And they, they provided me with a lot of really good information. And, and it was basic, you know, they, they felt like the, they needed good water. They needed good, solid boundary fence, preferably electric. Um, and then they needed something to be able to load and unload cattle. Um, you know, if you go out to some of our public lands, we have a, a parking lot and, and basically that's it with a, a fence around it. And so there really wasn't good infrastructure for loading and unloading cattle. I also in uh, early 2012 or 2013, I started to develop a list of producers. So anytime I would go into uh, grazing meetings or talk to individuals, I'd, I'd come home with a list of names and I'd add it to my list. And this is the list of folks that I reach out to anytime we're going to do any sort of agricultural program, whether it be farming or haying or, or grazing. Uh, individuals who are on this list um, will get a, an email from me. And if, if they don't want to participate, they just don't have to respond. Um, and so I started to develop that list. And then also at the same time, you, know, you can't do anything without a plan. And uh, I wanted to make sure that we identified what our habitat goals were and you know what we wanted to achieve on a site. And I, I had some interactions with a gentleman named Greg Hope, which you guys will hear from tomorrow. And I actually reached out to him and asked him for an example of a, a management plan. The state of Minnesota has done a really good job with grazing. And uh, I used the state of Minnesota's management plan and I, I modified it to fit our needs here in Western Wisconsin with help from um, my state partner, one, one of the state biologists who used to work in this part of the country. And we, we came up with a management plan. Um, and we focused our first grazing opportunity um, on a site called the, the Spring Meadows Complex, which is a piece of property. And you'll see a map here shortly, but it's a piece of property that's managed, um, owned and managed by the Fish and Wildlife Service. And then there's um, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resource land that's interconnected. And so rather than managing it separately, we looked at it as one big management unit and uh, developed a management plan for grazing on that site. Um, initially, we talked to neighbors because I, you know, I like to connect with my neighbors, let them know what I'm doing. And uh, I asked them about this idea of buying water from them because we, we just had the wetlands on the site. And then also buying electricity so that we could run electric fences out there. Uh, and they initially thought it was a great idea. And then the more they thought about it, they were just super concerned about the uh, liability associated with it. And so they, they bowed out. Um, we, I also explored fencing contracts as we manage um, roughly 44 pieces of property out here called waterfowl production areas. And through the help of Wisconsin DNR staff and some volunteers, um, we ended up putting the fence in ourselves. And I'll show you some pictures of that here shortly. And then through that listening, those listening meetings, I, I learned that there's a lot of producers in the area that don't have the ability to make smaller paddocks for grazing within a larger grazing unit. And so I started to build these solar uh, fencing kits that I would uh, lend out to producers when they brought their livestock out. And again, I'll show you pictures. And then one last thing that I did um, before grazing started on that Spring Meadows project is that I, I sent a letter out to all the landowners um, within one mile of the, the project site, um, just to let them know what was coming so that when they came out there and saw livestock on the unit, they would know that it was there on purpose and that they were helping us achieve some of our management goals. So. Um, I, again, I found that anytime there's something new and, 
and uh, strange that some of our neighbors may not have seen uh, recently that it, it's good to let them know ahead of time before they, they go out there and see it from themselves. Um, this is just a, a picture of some of the, the items that, that we purchased to put into this fencing this, this, uh, this fencing kit. Uh, we purchased some solar fencers. Uh, we purchased a bunch of pigtail posts, some poly wire and some spools. And I, I literally have the producer come and I load that in the back of their truck and then they go out and build the paddocks for us. And it, it's worked out really well. I purchased these in 2012, 2013, and we still are using them today. So they've, um, they were a little, a little expensive at the time, but um, I think if you buy things that are a little bit more expensive, they have a tendency to, to last a lot longer. And so that's what we did. Um, this is what the permanent fence looked like. Um, pretty good for a bunch of folks that hadn't worked together building fence before. Uh, it, it was a four strand high tinsel. The top three wires were um, hot and the bottom wire was, was a neutral wire. Yeah, and this is some of the temporary seasonal staff that came out to help build fence for me um, that summer. Um, to be honest, none of them had ever built fence before ever. And uh, they had a positive attitude and a willingness to learn. And, and we actually put in a lot of fence that summer. So that was great. Um, can you guys, can you, can you see my mouse here? Yep. Awesome. So this is the this is the Spring Meadows complex. Um, the the north part here that's surrounded in orange. Uh, we didn't graze that until 2015 because we hadn't finished the boundary fence on it. So um, we grazed this in 2014. I just wanted to show you this when I when I wrote when we wrote the management plan for it. This is how we laid out the paddocks for grazing. Um, we tried to make the paddocks all the same size. We tried to show water, put water out there. We put these, these, uh, these green dots or areas that we had a lot of brush issues. And so we were gonna put in some salt and mineral uh, blocks in those areas to congregate cattle to stress brush. Um, there is some oak savanna that we restored down in this lower part. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to show you this. This is very elaborate. Um, and this is something that I came up with in my office and I, we ended up bidding it out. This is what the, the, um, bid package cover page looked like. Um, we showed where it was at all the things that the producer would need to provide us to be able to bid on it. And, um, a deadline to make sure that they returned it on time. And we ended up with one bidder. And you know, for those of you who haven't spent a lot of time in Western Wisconsin, there just there are not a lot of grazers out here, um, so it's kind of a challenge to initially make these connections with potential grazers um, and open up opportunities on public lands for them to come and, and and graze and help us with some of our management. They the gentleman that bid on it, he bid five dollars an animal unit month, and if you've spent time out west you'll realize this is really really low <laughs> um, but through this bid process we let the local market set the price for grazing rather than the government saying hey you we, we need this from you well um yeah the local market said it was five dollars an animal unit month and he you know he, he started talking to his insurance company and he he just got cold feet he didn't have water or electricity and ultimately he backed out. So um, it happens, right? So, but within the Fish and Wildlife Service, if we've bid something out, we didn't get a bidder, then we can, we can take it to the next step and we can just do some trading with folks. Um, again, we're trying to get um, the biggest bang for the government, you know? But in the end, I contacted a gentleman named Dave who was a part of one of our original listening groups. And I, I said, Dave, what do you think about coming to graze this site? And he said, um, he, he, he wasn't sure. He said it was a really wet year. He didn't need the pastures. Uh, the pasture, he, he, he didn't really you know, wanna move his livestock that far. 
And there was still a bunch of fencing that needed to be done. But in the end, he said he would do it. He was a, a very shrewd negotiator. And uh, he ended up grazing that site at no cost um, for three years, which was great because we learned a lot from each other. You know, I learned a lot more about animal husbandry, uh, which I didn't know. And he learned more about rotational grazing and what we were trying to do um, to achieve some of our management goals. And uh, he was great at communication. He was um, great at moving animals when they needed to be moved, when we when, when the paddock was grazed to where we wanted it to be. And uh, he was phenomenal. And I hope to work with him again. Um, you know, originally you saw that map about how um, I thought of, you know, how we wanted to graze it um, in my office. Well, uh, we actually sat down together and came up with a different strategy because we didn't really have a lot of good water on the site. We ended up grazing it from west to east, so from paddock one, two, and three, and so on. We left this paddock up here in the northeastern corner as a refuge paddock because when we did our National Heritage Inventory uh, assessment that showed that we had Henslow sparrows on this site, and so we wanted to leave habitat behind for Henslow sparrows. And So we, we grazed uh, paddock one. And then um, when it was time to move, we just took the fence down, um, moved them to two, and then took the fence down and moved to three. And that whole time, the livestock went back and, and was able to get water, were able to get water out of the wetland there. Um, by the time they were done grazing paddock three, um, they were starting to spend a lot more time grazing regrowth in paddock one, which is not what we wanted to do. Um, but by the time we moved them to paddock four, we just closed off these first three paddocks so they didn't have an opportunity to go back and graze those areas. And we had plenty of recovery, um, vegetation recovery for the rest of the summer. Um, but there was a lot of water here in paddock four and five and six. And so, um, yeah, it was a, a good experience. And I, I learned a lot from Dave doing this. Now, uh, this is what it looked like the first day uh, when he dropped them off. Um, he dropped them off on July 9th. It took us a little bit to get the paperwork ironed out. Uh, I kept them there through September 14, uh, 24th. He had 36 yearlings out there um, for the first few weeks. And then in August, he dropped uh, four cows and a bull out there. And this is, this is kind of what it looked like after he pulled cattle off in September. Um, it, this picture is looking south. And this is the, the temporary fence that we put up uh, that separated the grazing units from the refuge paddock. So you can see there's, uh, this is, the, the, this is the, the piece of property that we left behind for, for Henslow Sparrows. Um, and then, so that was in 2014. And then in 20, end of 2014, we finished the fence on the Northern part of the unit. And we ended up installing a well on that site because long-term we wanna be able to graze that site. So we, um, we hired a contractor to come in and put in the well. Um, we knew we didn't have any electricity. So we, uh, I started to research solar systems and called a company in South Dakota and they, um, they hooked me up with a solar system. So we put, um, we pulled water out of the well using solar pumps. We filled, similar to what Erin did on her site, we filled a, a 900 gallon tank, uh, put it on a trailer. So we elevated it and then we used gravity to f uh, fill the water troughs. And um, that green dot is where the well went in. And then when we grazed this site in 20, 15, we just wagon wheeled around the center of that um, building paddocks that were roughly a week in size. Um, so livestock could spend one week in that paddock before moving on to the next one. Um, Dave uh, has pastures in multiple areas. And so he had a challenge of moving cattle on his own. And he ended up purchasing this OK Corral setup which is great. Um, it's a great tool that he used for loading and um, loading cattle back up at the end of the grazing season. Um, if you've never used one, I've, I've actually been out there helping them park cattle and uh, it's, a, it's a great tool. 
And then um, one of the things that we, we did to try and promote our grazing opportunity here on public land in Western Wisconsin, in 2014, we did a, a pasture walk with, um, with Brian, our partner with the River Country RCND, and then um, Wisconsin DNR staff came. Um, and then also we invited other producers who may be interested in grazing public lands uh, to come out and, and spend some time with us looking at what we've learned from each other. Uh, it was great. Uh, our partners had a chance to ask me questions. And then I think more importantly, had a, a chance to ask Dave, our, our grazer, questions about you know what went right, what went wrong, and um, what he thought of everything. And he gave a very candid and an honest opinion of it. And he thought it, I think, went really well. Uh, some of the lessons that I've learned. So Dave, Dave was awesome. And uh, in my second bullet, I'll kind of get to the importance of communication. But through this experience, we showed that, you know, with Dave and his free grazing for three years, we showed that it was possible. And we've grazed several other sites since. And every year we we get people bidding on it. So there is there is an interest in our local community. Um, this last year, we ended a grazing uh, contract early with a, a permittee who, you know, I worked really hard and my partner with the Wisconsin DNR worked really hard to, um, to have him be compliant. Uh, he spent more time chasing cattle that got out than actually moving fence to create new paddocks. So it was, it was very, very challenging. And so it's, it's really important to find producers and cultivate relationships with producers who are, you know, who are willing to work with you to help you achieve your goals. Cause it, it, it is uh, very challenging when you get a producer who, uh, who's not willing to work with you and has challenges with cattle using electric fence. So uh, we also learned that mobile water systems and electric fencers are, are great for moving cattle where you want them to be to help you achieve your, your management goals. And then um, I thought, you know, I'd have more fence built <laughs> in, uh, in the time that I've been here to provide more opportunities on waterfowl production areas, but it just, it just takes time and we have to be really creative on finding funding for, 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 for building infrastructure, so. And then lastly, I, you know, I remember one of my learning points, it's from a colleague over in Minnesota, his name's JB. Um, I kept calling him, he, he, he administers a grazing program out of the Litchfield or uh, Morris Wetland Management District. And I, I called him all the time about questions. And he, he said, Chris, just make it work. <laughs> you know, um, there's lots of different ways to, to make this happen. You just got to find a way that's going to work for you and just make it happen. Um, just, start grazing and, and, uh, figure out what works for you. And, and, um, hopefully you're, you're, you're successful. And if you're not learn from those mistakes and, and move on. Um, currently just this, just my last few slides currently, um, I have about 70 producers on our list who are interested in agricultural programs. When I got here, the list was zero. So that's, that's huge. Um, we only have six, waterfall production areas that have infrastructure around them that'll support grazing. We've grazed four of those sites, three growing seasons, and one of those sites for six growing seasons since 2012. Um, and then two of those sites we hope to graze in, again in 2022. Um, we still have 38 water, more units, 38 more waterfall production areas that we want to um, develop to be able to support grazing. And we're prioritizing the ones that are more challenging to burn. So the ones that are closer to interstates, um, closer to cities where, where, where we have hospitals and things like that with smoke issues. Um, so those are the, the units that we're targeting first. And then also uh, in, the, in the future, we're gonna explore uh, ideas for exchange of services to, to build infrastructure. So for example, in 2018, rather than um, paying to graze, I asked um, through the bid process, I asked the producer to put in a well for us. And so he put in a well for, I think $4,200. 
And then we supplied our solar system, which we had purchased in 2013 to provide water to them on that site. And so I think in the future, we're gonna do more of that um, in the form of boundary fence. So if people will uh, put up the fence or you know, even buy materials to put up the boundary fence, uh, then they can graze on us for a, a reduced cost or no cost. And again, we'll spell all that out through the bid process so that people know um, what they're bidding on. And then I guess at this time, I, that's the end of my, my presentation. If there's, if there's any questions. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, you bet. One question here is that handling system was quite elaborate. What does a handling system like that have to, what is a cost um, to have the ease of, you know, pulling in with a trailer and making lives, you know, because unloading livestock is easy. Getting them back on the yeah. trailer is a challenge. Um, what does a system like that cost? Do you know? You know, I'll have to look. I, I think it was, uh, it was expensive. But, but he uses it all the time for his own operation and he's willing to rent it out. But I'll, I'll, uh, I'll look up what the OK Corral system costs. I'm sure there's others out there. That system was perfect for, for him. Um, I've had other producers put up cattle panels uh, in, a, in a smaller area and then coax animals into that and load and offload from, from that. But with this OK Corral system, it actually has a chute on it. So you can just push livestock up onto your trailer and, and get them out of there. It worked really slick. Awesome. Awesome. There was a wetland area that you watered out of. Um, did you have problems with invasive species? Did the livestock do damage around the, that? It looked like a small lake. Yeah. So um, in the north, so there's the south unit of our, if you remember back to that picture, and there was that wetland in the northwest corner that was solid reed canary grass. So it was all reed canary grass all the way around it. And uh, after grazing it for three years, uh, I can actually see native um, sedges coming up through there uh, when before it was just solid reed canary grass. And if it was a higher valued wetland with more um, native wetland species, then I, I wouldn't have used it as a watering source. Um, the cattle trampled it, they spent some time in there, um, but for the most part, they didn't, they didn't damage it because the wetland was already in, in poor condition. Okay, great. Also has, have you used any other species such as goats on your oh, properties? Yeah, so I haven't used goats, but my partner with the Wisconsin DNR, um, she, her name is uh, Michelle. M Michelle was a biologist for the DNR. She used goats on spring meadows on the east side, um, the southeast side, and they were, they were great. He, um, they were out there for two years. The first year, the goats were just trying to figure things out. And then the second year, um, they started to do more um, brush control. But I found that with goats, they're just, you know, one piece of an integrated pest management plan. They'll, they'll stress woody vegetation uh, and open things up for you as a manager to come in and use other tools in there like basal bark treatment or mowing or um, things like that. So yeah, goats were great. We've used sheep. Um, sheep are just small cattle. You just need more of them. Um, and that was fun too. We had sheep out on a unit um, really close to waterfall season and folks would come in, walk by the sheep and there was uh, great Pyrenees dogs out there with them, with the sheep and um, barking at people. <laughs> and so that was kind of fun to work with hunters to, uh, uh, to tell them that they're, they're supposed to be there and they're, they're, they, they just stay away from them and you'll be just fine. Now, you mentioned having those smaller species animals. Were there any problems with predator pressures? You know, we didn't, I didn't observe any. Um, with those, um, 
the protection animals that were out there with them, they, they did just fine. With the goats, they had a llama that was out there um, with them. And so as long as there's a, a, um, a protection animal with them, I, I believe that there's, there, there, there would be minimal issues. And in fact, that's what we've observed here, as long as they've had protection animals there with them. Um, we have had no mortality from, from coats or, for, or other predators. Knock on wood. Okay, another question is, did you have pushback to use grazing as a practice from your echelon within Fish and Wildlife Service? Uh, no, <laughs> uh, that's a hard no. So in the Fish and Wildlife Service, it's, it's acceptable. Uh, grazing is a, is a tool and we actually, it's promoted to explore opportunities to graze. Um, grazing is used in the Fish and Wildlife Service across the country. So um, I, I received no um, challenges from the folks in our regional office about grazing or refuge leadership. They were very supportive. Okay, another question. The photo of your grazed area versus the refuge area appeared to show a high degree of utilization on the grazed area. Could you discuss more of your objectives for the grazing on this site? Yeah, so, um, so we're, uh, my mind's just racing. I can go so many different directions with this. And so I apologize if I'm stuttering, um, but uh, we, use, we use grazing to, um, to control litter, knock back litter. We use it for brush control to a certain degree. You know, we like animals to spend time in areas where there's brush. Um, I also like to stress cool season. So we have a lot of cool and warm season mixed plantings. And so I like cattle to spend time during the active growing season of cool season grasses in areas where there's lots of cool seasons. <laughs> Uh, to try and promote or provide a competitive advantage to warm season grasses. And then in areas where we have a lot of warm season grasses, I'll just try and flash graze through there, um, have them spend very little time in the warm season areas until after the active growing season. So um, that slide, I think that you saw, um, we may have hit the warm season grasses a little hard, but the following year they, they bounced right back. So um, it's a good eye. So now you're kind of indicating that you're grazing on prairie type habitat, correct? Yeah, it's most, I mean, it's planted. We don't have a lot of remnants that we manage with grazing. Um, so that's all planted grasslands. We've inherited or purchased sites that were cool season that we interceded with warm season native species that we're managing. And then we've also um, acquired agricultural fields that we've receded back to um, predominantly warm season, high diversity plantings. Then we, I graze them, just oh, graze okay. them heavier in the spring and then lightly graze them during the growing season of the warm season grasses. Another question for you, Chris, mm -hmm. is how do you monitor weather you are or how are you monitoring to assess whether you're meeting your objectives and have you ever had an absolute train wreck that ended up being a positive after you allowed the habitat to recover yeah so i'll i'll um i guess i'll i'll address the train wreck and then go back to the monitoring so um the last three years have been really challenging with a producer who didn't move cattle when we needed them moved. And um, for that reason, and the fact that it was very challenging for that person to keep their cattle contained on the WPA and they spent a lot of time in neighboring cornfields, we let him go um, as, a, as a grazer. But he spent a very long time with his livestock in an area that was 
uh, a Savannah restoration project that we'd worked on a few years ago that had a lot of brush in it. And it, it looked like a golf course when he was done. And um, he should have moved them sooner, but it looked like a golf course. And that was in the spring of the year during um, cool season when cool season grasses were actively growing. But when we came back to that site the following year, um, or even later that year, there was just a ton more warm season grasses that have poked up through there. It's a challenge for us to do forb monitoring. Uh, we don't, we haven't done that yet. Um, currently, we've uh, we're doing a rapid assessment grassland monitoring technique to identify presence absence of species to try and see trends. Um, but that's that's one thing we need to do more of is monitoring. And I'm 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 always looking for uh, opportunities or ideas from other partners. And so if you have a a monitoring technique that sees change in forb concentrations over time and composition of grass, um, hit me up because I'd love to talk to you more about it. But we do see a lot of brush, you know, just from an ocular estimation standpoint, we do see good impact on brush. Is it eliminating brush? No, um, but it's just part of an, an integrated management technique for setting back brush to give us time to get chemical out there or a prescribed burn uh, a few years later when enough fuel has recovered to carry a fire through there. All right. Have you utilized patch burn grazing methods? I haven't yet. Um, I do wanna go somewhere uh, and tour someone who has done patch burn grazing. I hear good things about it. And um, I just don't know how to implement it on our scale here in Western Wisconsin. I mean, we manage sites that are anywhere from 17 acres in size to 400 acres in size or more. And I'm just not sure how to, um, to use that on these, in these smaller uh, patches. So um, I just, I haven't done it yet. I'm open to it, um, but I, I would like to go and tour someone that's doing that um, to see their perspective and then figure out how to do it here. It's just hard to burn and then graze. You know, if a site's being grazed that I feel like there's management going on that. And so we've just focused fire in areas that there isn't management going on just to try and separate them. But there, I'm sure there's opportunity to do some overlap management using both. Are you aware of other U.S. Fish and Wildlife sites that are being grazed in Wisconsin? No. Second part, if no. I'm sure they're open to it. So if you, if you have an idea and you're interested in it, if you reach out to your local Fish and Wildlife Service office and you, hate, you say you explore this idea of grazing on public lands, they have wanted to do it. They just haven't found that, that right partner yet, so. Okay, what do, you talked a little bit about the neighbors getting, you know, used to the smoke. Um, what do your neighbors think about the grazing? Um, oh. and, and have you had pushback from um, your user groups? Yeah, so. You know, we, we graze, we graze 200 acres, I think this last year, maybe 250 acres on the, the liberal side. And we have the eight counties that I work in, in Western Wisconsin, we have 200,000 acres of public land. And so if someone comes in, they're upset that, um, that we're grazing in their pheasant hunting spot. Um, I just redirect them to other areas. I mean, honestly, we're, um, we get to work for the public in, in this field and there is no time in my career where I've made everyone happy with some of the management decisions I've made. And so um, at some points in time, we just agree to disagree. Um, but I, you know, I try to leave those interactions in a positive way, but you know, not all the time is that, that possible. And then you had another question, uh, a second part of that question. I don't think I answered how about your user groups? Oh, um, 
yeah, they just, I just feel like, you know, I haven't had a lot of negative interaction from other user groups except hunters, but, um, you know, several years after livestock have come off a site, I've received kudos from hunters, you know, saying that we've done a great job. Um, and then neighbors, you know, it's been kind of fun to watch this over time. So uh, when I first started burning here at St. Croix in 2010 with the staff, you know, people would swing by and ask why we were burning up all this forage. And, you know, dare I say, we, um, we had obscene, um, um, hand gestures when we were burning. <laughs> and I, I find that I get far less of that now. Um, and, I, you know, it's easier for me to tell my story now or tell the story of the St. Croix Wetland Management District when I can, I can reach out to folks and say, if you're interested in grazing or, or, or farming or haying or any sort of agricultural program, just shoot me your name and contact information and I'll add you to my list. And then um, having them see an email from me once a year or every other year showing that we're reaching out to our local ag community to ask for help with management has been awesome, I think. Do you have any last take home messages, Chris, that you would like to share with the group? Yeah, I think, you know, if folks are interested in grazing and maybe those that already are grazing, I think you know, the more partners you can bring in to this, the easier it's going to be. And so groups like this, and, you know, if anyone's interested in grazing and you want to bounce some ideas off me or, or others on this call, feel free to reach out because I think expanding your network is, is always good. Uh, and the more minds you have in this to develop your grazing program, the easier it's going to be. It doesn't have to be all on your shoulders. Um, there's lots of other people out here who are doing it um, and can make your lives a lot easier. Well, and it sounds like you also had the opportunity, you know, working with a non-governmental agency as well as, you know, you really reached out to a broader ag community and a broader resource community to help you advance, advance your program. So that's fantastic job on innovative speaking. Thanks, Mary C. Thanks for your help on all this too. Not a problem. <laughs> and I see Miss Kelsey has turned her camera on. Yes, I want to jump in and just say, um, looks like there aren't any more questions for today, but I wanted to thank our presenters. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Mary C. Thank you, Aaron, for your time and expertise today. Um, we really appreciate it. And I just, I learned a lot. I hope all of y'all did too. And to Chris's point about like connecting, um, again, I encourage you all to sign up for Regain and join that discussion group. And we'll talk about it again more tomorrow. Um, and in the chat box, Jane is going to put a link to an exit survey. Um, and it's very short, I promise. And it really helps us. We really want your feedback. Um, and it really helps us design future series and sessions and webinars and all of that. Um, so please take a moment to complete that. We will be back here tomorrow at the same time. You're going to use the same Zoom link. Um, so we'll see everybody back here tomorrow at 2 p.m. And just so you get something to look forward to, um, um, Greg Corner is going to talk about the research and case studies he's written about grazing and public lands kind of outside the Midwest and any sort of um, anything we can glean for the Midwest region from there. And then also Greg Hoke and Kelly Anderson from Minnesota are going to talk about grazing in Minnesota and, oh, I'm sorry, 1 p.m. Central. I'm, in, I'm on the East Coast. <laughs> I get my time zones confused. Um, uh, and they're going to talk about grazing Minnesota grazing impacts on wildlife habitat, et cetera, et cetera. And it's going to be great. Um, so again, thank you all for coming today and, and taking time out of your days, your busy days. And we will see everybody um, back here tomorrow. So thanks so much and have a great rest of your day.